Happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Hi everyone, it's Katrina and thank you so much for clicking. So the month of May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and for this month I really wanted to make a video talking a little bit more about my culture and my experience growing up as an Asian American. You might be familiar with the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, and so that's kind of my idea for this video. I wanted to share short anecdotes through photos, so let's go. First photo is a picture of me and my mentee Martin, and I want to talk a little bit about my Chinese name and what I'm wearing here. So my Chinese name is Ye Chiaor in Mandarin, and I believe the name could be translated to skillful child. And in Chiu Chao, it's pronounced Yap Ka Yi. In Hokkien, it's Yap Ka Li. And in Cantonese, it's Yi Pao Yi. So nobody really calls me that because everybody in my family just calls me Na or Na Na, which is a shortened version of Katrina. But yeah, that is, that's my Chinese name. And then two, I'm wearing a Qi Pao here, which is the traditional like Chinese dress for women. Um, and this was my first time wearing a Qi Pao. It's actually my roommate's, but I was emceeing for a Lunar New Year event and she let me borrow it and I just felt so, so beautiful in it. And I remember um, just thinking to myself that I really wanted to wear one for my wedding. So that is still on the agenda. I hope I can find a really nice one. Yeah, thank you, Darcy. So the second photo here is a photo of me and my preschool class. That is me in the front center. And I use this photo to talk a little bit about the community that surrounded me growing up. Um, so I've said this in multiple videos before, but from the get-go, the community that I went to school with, the community that I lived around, were filled with a lot of people who looked like me. So even though I was a minority, I didn't often feel like one growing up because there were so many people around me that had similar backgrounds, similar family histories, spoke similar languages at home, um, ate the same food. And so I never felt like I was really embarrassed of my culture because so many people around me also had the same culture. And I think because of that, I was able to develop a very strong sense of cultural pride and belonging and self-worth. And this wasn't something that I realized until I got much older. I actually took a class this past fall and we learned about colonial education and the effect that it has on minority students in America and across the world. And I did a whole paper on the benefits of ethnic enclaves for minority students, especially in America, and how having these ethnic enclaves not only help foster this sense of belonging and um, confidence and self-worth in these students, but it also has benefits towards their academic performance, right, social performance and how they view themselves in comparison to their peers. It made me think a lot about my own experience growing up, but also as an educator, how can I make sure that these spaces are created in the schools so that all students feel the sense of belonging. So this next picture here is a picture of me coming home from Chinese school and this is the award that I got and a couple of trophies that my sister and I accumulated throughout the years. So I'm going to try to speak this in Mandarin. <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音> So we asked our parents if we can quit and they said yes. Um, but in retrospect, I'm really regretful that I quit because I feel like I could have gotten a lot better. But I'm not that good, as you can tell, but um, yeah, so that's, that's me, Chinese school. Everybody hated it, but we're very grateful in retrospect. So the next photo I have here is a picture of me and my family on Chinese New Year slash Lunar New Year and this is the typical food that we have there. So I'm going to try to speak this one in Chi Chao. <laughs> Nang Pingsi Si Jia Hejo Wasyang Hi Hua Jia Hejo 
嘅，小豆吧，阿吧，烤柴，我唔知是是唔是叫烤柴，唔有，但个个佢个柴养养猫啫，哈，啊有海，大人找到几个枪，农业找几个枪，可能只。所以，咱都来买来食，好好去，我买来，大家新年快乐，这个是好讲话。好，咱吃草、走走，好，嗯，我妈咪我拍红包，哈哈，咱吃红包，啊，咱等去来买来，好，博鸡，过年时候博鸡是 OK， 人人博鸡，啊，是是博 quarter， 不是博 like 金仔鸡。可能想啊，挂个挂个 game， 好老，人家是好老，有人家去下海，有人家啊，谷，唔知，嗯，十三条麻雀，咪解啊，真真大只，全部系来，嘻哈哈哈。Yeah, that's Chinese New Year and also my shabby chew chow. <laughs> so for the next photo, I'm just gonna put a bunch of food photos here. So. For my family, both Vietnamese and Chinese food are very much a part of our everyday lives and culture, and I'm so glad because I freaking love both Vietnamese and Chinese food. Um, I'm just gonna show a bunch of pictures here. So this is my grandparents and Bun Hoi, and this is over here Chai Tao Guo that my aunt made, and I really love Bet Moi, which is just white porridge. It's like my favorite comfort food when I come home. Um, I just like. All the like little preserved food that we eat with it, including, let me show you. This is pork sung brought from California all the way to Massachusetts. Um, this is like what I sprinkle on top of porridge. I also really love dao si liang hu, which is like this canned uh, preserved fish with salty black beans. And it doesn't sound good and it doesn't really look that good, but it is so bomb. I love it. A lot of people who bring, you know, ethnic foods to school, sometimes they have this traumatizing experience where everybody makes fun of them. And I did have an experience like that, but it wasn't as traumatizing because I was a lot older. So in high school, I remember that I would bring um, food, and one dish that I brought was tu ba cha kia, which is this ground pork and ginger, and I love it. It's super good. Um, and I brought it with rice, and I didn't get to eat it in time during lunch, so I had to bring it to my fifth period class. And I remember it was like. Open a jar. I didn't start eating yet, but my teacher, who by the way, like I'm not mad at him or anything. I'm his friend. Like we're friends on social media. He's a really cool, nice guy. But I think what he did was a little insensitive. So that day, um, he was like, "Oh my gosh, who brought fish into my classroom? Smells so bad." And then he looked at me like, "It was you, wasn't it? What is that? Do not bring that into my classroom ever again." And I was a little bit mortified, just sitting in the front like. Oh my gosh! Okay, I didn't take it like, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed of what I'm eating, and I'm never gonna bring this to school again. More so, just like I'm not gonna bring this into his classroom again. This stuff is good, and it smells good. It's not even fish to begin with. I do understand that. I think certain smells can be a little bit off-putting or foreign to people, but I don't think, and I would not suggest you call out anybody's food like that. Like, I think yucking people's yum is so distasteful.、Um, I wouldn't do it. So the next photos are pictures of me and my sister, and this is when I was about like nine, ten, eleven, and this is really when my hair started to kind of get crinkly and frizzy and wavy towards the front parts of my hair.、Um, and growing up, when I was very young, my hair was very straight, and all of a sudden, as I got a little bit older, my hair started getting very frizzy, and it was a really difficult transition for me. Because all my friends, my sister,、uh, my family, they had straight hair, very silky straight, like that Asian hair、um, that I desperately wanted. And I remember just it was so hard to like look at myself in the mirror every day and just have this like frizz ball. I couldn't have the cute bangs that everybody had because the shorter that my hair went, like the crazier it would get. When I got my hands on a straightener, like that was my baby. I would. Never go to school without straightening my hair. It is still something that, like, if I were to do one thing to make myself feel better and look better, it, in my own eyes, like, I straighten my hair. So these next photos are gonna be of my family, and I just want to talk a little bit about the struggle that I've had and still have when trying to balance between the filial piety of. Asian culture and the individualism of American culture. I'm constantly like faced with trying to balance these two, 
and this has definitely rang true when I'm making these bigger decisions like where to go to school. Um, I'm for certain that a huge, huge, huge reason why I chose UCI over UC Davis was because it was closer to my family. Um, that's why making that decision to even move across the country to come to Harvard was such a difficult decision. And even in terms of like who I'm dating, um, I think whether or not like my family approves or gets along with them is such a huge factor and it's not always been like the easiest, but I, I do think that that is something huge that I consider. And I think along the lines of that, something that, you know, me, my cousins, my sister, and also the older generation are trying to navigate is this balance between being more open-minded to the other generation and not just kind of butting heads uh, time after time and trying to be more understanding about where we're coming from as this generation and where they're coming from knowing that everybody in our family is very sensitive but just trying to be open and understanding I think is is this ongoing struggle and journey. I'm happy to say that I think there's been a lot of improvement but I think there's always going to be more learning that we all can do. So these next photos I'm, I want to put are going to be <laughs> me and my sister in our very K-pop fangirl phase in high school and I just want to talk about comments that I've got throughout the year saying oh you look Korean wow you look just like a Korean girl just like a Japanese girl and my relatives or friends or acquaintances they're always saying this as a compliment and it wasn't until I got older that I realized how probably problematic it was that people are saying oh you look Korean or Japanese as a compliment rather than saying hey you look good. A lot of times when my relatives say it before I was just kind of like thumbs up give you a little sticker but more so I think I'm trying to say like no I look like a Chinese girl, I look like a Chinese American girl and I want to look like a Chinese American girl. For these next photos I want to share a little bit about my experience as an Asian American stepping outside of my bubble of my hometown um, and of me in college as an undergrad and me in grad school here in Massachusetts. So in undergrad I worked a lot with international students and they primarily came from China and so I started to identify myself and others would identify me as an ABC or an American born Chinese or a domestic student. Um, that would come out a lot because I would be in a lot of mentoring programs where we would mentor international students um, and I felt like it was a great position and advantage point for me because I was able to navigate and kind of switch, code switch a little bit and understand both cultures, the Chinese culture and also the American culture. So I felt, I felt really good about my identity there. So now coming to Harvard, Massachusetts, it's really the first time where I'm experiencing um, not being a part of the majority in terms of what I look like. And for the first time, I'm in classes where it's very visible that I am one of only few Asians and I have struggled a lot with where my voice fits in in what often seems like this racial binary and this is something I touched upon on my presentation video as well and I was talking about this with my friend the other day who is also Asian American that sometimes in these spaces like for the first time where we're talking about Asian Americans in an educational space we have conflicting feelings because on the one hand it's great to like whoa we're finally talking about the group I belong to but at the same time whenever Asian Americans are brought up it's not in a good light right it's talking about the model minority myth or stereotypes or the Chinese Exclusion Act or COVID-19 and all the discrimination and so it, it's just this kind of like conflicting feeling where it's like yay we're finally being talked about and then like oh god everything is really shitty um, so there's, there's those kind of feelings that arise. So the last picture I have is this picture of me and Ryan going to see the farewell in fall. And I want to use this to talk a little bit about Asian representation in media. So recently my friend and I were talking about this increase in Asian representation in the media and how exciting it was to see things like Never Have I Ever, Kim's Convenience, um, fresh off the boat, Crazy Rich Asians, and how problematic it is that people are looking to these shows to represent the entire group that they're depicting. I think an example of this is when people were getting mad at Crazy Rich Asians because it was not depicting Chinese people in what they saw as accurate, right? They were saying, not everybody is rich like this, this is just a very small set. But that movie was never looking to represent all Chinese people. But I think it's because there's not a lot of Chinese people in the media. We look to these couple of movies that we can get to see, oh, is this going to tell my story correctly? Like we look to see a reflection of ourselves. Um, and in some ways it is and it's great. But in many ways when we feel like, oh, they got it wrong, it, it becomes this like tension because we get 
so concerned about how people are going to perceive our group. Whereas we never look at Friends, the TV show, or like nothing's really coming to my mind except Hannah Montana or Will and Grace or Everybody Loves Raymond. Um, even though I didn't really watch those shows, no one's really looking to them and say, but that's not really how my family and my friend group is because there's so many white families and friends depicted on television. But there's not a lot of Indian Americans, so people are going to look to Never Have I Ever to see, well, how good of a job did they do? Did they exaggerate these stereotypes a little bit too much? But in the end, like, I'm really excited to see these shows, but I think that it's um, something that needs to be talked about, that these shows are not trying to be representative of every single Asian American family out there. So that's all for this video. I hope you all found it either to be enjoyable, relatable, interesting, or learn something new. If you can relate to anything, comment down below or um, just say hello. I want to wish everybody a happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!